without any further ado, let's bring up our first panelist of the uh, afternoon. I have legendary animator back here, John Pomeroy. John Pomeroy, give him a welcome to the hey. stage. <laughs> Come on up. It's in your hands, sir. Take it away. Thank you. Hey, it's great to be here. Big audience. We're the few but the faithful, right? And to all of our YouTube audience, welcome. Um, my name is John Pomeroy, and I've been in the animation industry for almost a half a century. I don't feel that old. Honest. <laughs> it's, a, it's a medium, it's a career that keeps you very young. Believe me. There have been animators that I have known. Um, the guy who created Betty Boop, for instance, his name was Grim Natwick. He was 101 uh, when he passed away. He was animating right up to the very end. So it's a, it's a career that has great longevity. Um, the common comment I keep getting at my table is that um, you, you've animated my, my entire childhood. So it's like, I guess I have. It's like my, my career spans all the way back to the, to the early 70s up until present day. Um, I started out at Disney Studios back in 1973, and uh, it's been um, a romance ever since. I love animating, I love drawing cartoons, and I love creating personalities uh, out of nothing. It just happens on the paper, and it's magic. Um, one of the things that... Um, um, I often get asked is, what's your favorite character? And I'm gonna do a quick little PowerPoint presentation. I'll point out the character who is one of my favorites. Um, let's see if I can go forward here. So when I started in 1973, Disney had just developed their um, animation trainee program. And it was a program that was looking for uh, young artists who are interested in a career in animation or background painting or layout or storyboarding uh, because they knew that the first string animation staff that had worked so closely with Walt Disney over the years were now retiring and they wanted to pass on that legacy to the next generation of artists. So they began looking uh, at schools and colleges across the country for talent who would be interested in a career in animation. So I had been trying to submit portfolios since 1966. Even when Walt was still alive, I took my first portfolio. I got turned down. The guard at the gate says, oh, it looks very nice, but you can't come in. We're not hiring anybody. But that didn't deter me any because I, I knew what I wanted to do. The passion was overboiling in me. And it takes a, pa a certain amount of passion to be able to, to want to create personalities from nothing. And I had that. So, um, what happened was I went to Art Center College of Design uh, in order to prepare a portfolio they would be dazzled by and accept me. And I submitted my second portfolio in 1971 and got turned down. That was a crusher. But, fear not, I persevered and I tried and attempted again a couple of years later in 1973. They accepted my portfolio and I was welcomed aboard the trainee program. And my first mentor was a man by the name of Eric Larson, who was a part of a elite collection of Disney animation artists known as the Nine Old Men. Now, they're doing an exhibition of the artwork of the Nine Old Men at the Disney Family Museum in San Francisco right now as we speak, and it's amazing. It actually brings tears to my eyes because some of the artwork of my mentors, I watched them create that. But my first, uh, my first professional animation job happened about four months after I was recruited as a trainee. I guess my timing was perfect because had I come any earlier or a little bit later, I would have been made an assistant to some other animator, but they, they advanced me so quickly right out of the program. My first job was on Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. And I animated a, um, a small sequence at the very end of the picture where Tigger is told by Rabbit that he can't bounce anymore because he creates so much havoc. And, Ra and Tigger is crushed by this. So part of my presentation is I like to draw and you know, uh, to see people draw, especially old school on pad and paper. I know most of my students draw digitally, but I still like pad and paper. So I'm gonna draw you a Tigger. So what we do is we start with a basic shape, kind of a football. 
like so. And then his great big nose. And then animation, when animators draw, they like to construct the character with very simple basic shapes for consistency and volume. And it just, it's a lot easier to control how the character looks, because we want to make sure that the character is always on model, that every Tigger that's done by any other artist looks the same. So we have Tigger, well, let's put in his eyes, and then a little eye mask that's over that's made up out of his eyebrows, and then his mouth underneath his nose. and then the crest of his muzzle, and then we'll capture one of the stripes on either side of his forehead, little tuft of hair at the top, the wrinkles in his ear, the bottom of his jaw, stripe that comes up, his tiger stripes coming up the side of his, of his uh, cheek, a couple of whiskers, his neck, there's his white chest color, there's a couple of stripes hugging his neck, his shoulder, and there's Tigger. Now, I can't draw a Tigger without drawing his, uh, his cohort, cohort and co-host on the show, Winnie the Pooh. And in this sequence that I did on uh, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, I had to animate Christopher Robin, Tigger, Rabbit, Kanga and Roo, and of course, Winnie. So, let's see, we start with his top of his head, his eyebrow, we put an eye line there and an ear there, an ear there, the back side of his head, his little muzzle and mouth. I get asked to draw lots of Winnie the Pooh, so drawing Winnie the Pooh has come easier and easier as the years go by. There's his other cheek. There's his little jersey, his shoulder, his arm. There's his sleeve. There's the front part. And I'll have him waving to the audience. He's waving to you. Everybody in, in uh, YouTube land, please wave back. <laughs> So we have Winnie the Pooh. So that was my first um, animation, professional animation uh, gig with, um, with Disney Studios. Now let's see if they've got the next one placed here. There we go. So after I finished working on Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, they were pleased enough with my work to where they assigned me to one of the other, men my future mentors, Ollie Johnston, who was another member of the Nine Old Men. Ollie Johnson animated some of the great uh, Disney films like Pinocchio, Jungle Book, uh, and he was working on the character of Penny in The Rescuers. And he wanted me to be part of his team, so I co-animated Penny with Ollie Johnson, which was a great honor. And uh, uh, the Rescuers story with Bernard and Bianca, the two mice are trying to rescue Penny from the clutches of Madame Medusa who's kind of the, he, she's the evil villain that wants the devil's eye, this gigantic diamond that's hidden in this hole. And there's no way to get in through the hole except using a small little girl, which she kidnaps from the orphanage. And uh, I was on that production for about two and a half years. It was a great experience. Ollie Johnston was a terrific, patient mentor. He was teaching me very, um, he was passing on his trade secrets about how to animate dialogue, how to create personalities. And, uh, you know, he had such a beautiful way of drawing, and I was captivated when he would sit down and draw over my penny drawings. I would take my rough drawings in there and hand them to him, and he would review them and critique them, and then he would put a piece of paper on top and just carefully draw over it, and it was absolutely amazing. Um, next after that, was Pete's Dragon. And this was an interesting, uh, very challenging picture because it involved the combination of live action and animation together. 
uh, the dragon would have to be animated once they shot the live action footage because I would have to know where my eye direction was and how I would respond to the actor or actress who was speaking to Elliot, who was the dragon. And um, there was one sequence there where uh, the dragon picks up Sean Marshall, who is the actor playing Pete, placing him on his neck, and they did a dance together. And so I talked with the choreographer, Ona White, you know, about some of the, some of the dance steps that he could use. Because I, I was kind of hemmed in because they had photographed Sean Marshall on the top of a boom crane that the gaffer would move around in a, in a sort of a dance step, and I had to fit the dragon underneath him. So that was a real challenge. Uh, but it was fun. I really enjoyed that picture, working on that picture. After that, um, uh, I had met, while I was at Disney in 1973, I was introduced to my two future partners, Don Bluth and Gary Goldman. And we kind of formed an alliance, and we were all driven by the passion to learn all that there was about animation. And um, we, we knew that we were being taught very well about the craft of animation, but not so much the business of animation. We didn't know anything about scoring sessions or putting together animatics or budgeting an animated feature film. And so what we did was we started moonlighting on weekends in Don's garage trying to figure out answers to these questions. And while we were doing that, we were creating our own short films so we could be prepared to fill the shoes of the retiring animators that were leaving, leaving Disney Studios. And um, um, after about a, a two or three year period, we began to notice that Disney was kind of in a creative rut. And uh, we were wondering, would it be easier and better for us just to leave and start our own studio? After we, were, uh, we thought, you know, competition breeds excellence, and it's almost like the son that grows up and has to leave home. So <laughs> we, we began thinking, okay, if we had the funding to uh, support ourselves as an animation studio, we would leave and start our own studio and work on our own films. And the first film that we did as an independent company when we left Disney Studios, and we did that in um, September 13th, 1979. I remember the day well walking in with our resignations. And they were very sad about us leaving. They didn't want us to go, but they, they knew, you know, our hearts were in trying to, uh, you know, build this studio on our own. Our first film that we did was called The Secret of Nim. It features a, a small mouse by the name of Mrs. Brisby. And um, I'll draw you a picture of her. Mrs. Brisby was the uh, key figure in this, uh, animated feature film. Her name was changed from originally in the, the book. It's Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. But we ran into a, um, a franchise problem with the wham people because of the Frisbee throwing disc. So we had to change it to Brisbee. So our editor, uh, Dave Horton, had to meticulously change all the F sounds to B sounds, Brisbee. <laughs> so, um, she was a very sympathetic character. The, she was voiced by uh, a, a wonderful actress by the name of uh, Elizabeth Hartman. We had great voice casting for that film. John Carradine, who was like old Hollywood to us, uh, did the voice of the great owl. Uh, Dom DeLuise, who was like family to us, did uh, the voice of Jeremy. It was a great cast. Anyway, uh, as as I was saying previously, we start with a basic shape for Mrs. Brisby's character. So we start with a circle, and then her, her uh, nose is like a, um, almost like, a, like a, a bent teardrop. And then her eye line, and the placement of her eyes. We usually do a median line down the center is where her, um, the eye line is surrounded by a mask on either side. And there's her eyebrow. There's a little color separation down the middle of her forehead. And then her muzzle and then nose. And then we have her pupil.
and then some lovely eyelashes coming off the edges, top edges of her eyes, and then her cheek, and the bottom of her cheek, and then her, her mouth. And she's got cute little teeth, little mouse teeth. And then we fill out the cheek on the other side. And coming off the back side of her cheek are, is her cheek fur with a little color separation right there. And there's a color separation around up over her um, two eyebrows. And then working up from the back of her head is her ears. There's a tuft of hair coming off the top of her head. And here's the finished ear with some some little tiny whiskers coming from the inside of her ear. And then whiskers coming off her muzzle. And then she wears a little, little cape with a little tie in the front. I'll put her hands there and her arms. And there's Mrs. Frisbee. So that production lasted for about two and a half years, and we completed it in 1982. And when it was released, it didn't do all that well because the uh, company who was handling the uh, promotions and the um, distribution didn't really know how to handle an animated feature. And that year, we were up against the movie E.T. So nobody saw any other movie except E.T. that year. Uh, the, but the ironic part is there's a, a cult following for this film. With years and years that went by, it's become very, very popular. As a matter of fact, that character is probably one of the most popular characters I do at my table. If people are asking me to do commissions, it's either Mrs. Brisby or Milo Thatch from Atlantis the Lost Empire. But Mrs. Brisby has gotten very popular. And one of the fans of the movie, ironically, was Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> he came to our studio, and we had like a two, three-hour lunch together, and he said, I can't believe that you guys did that film. I thought that type of artwork was finished, was done, because Disney's not doing that anymore with the glistening dew drops and all the minutia and effects, animation details. He loved that. And he said, if I can find the right property, would you guys partner with me and we can animate? We can, we can produce an animated feature film together and bring animation back the way it should be. And we said, yes, we'll do it. So um, he was going to go out and search for the right property. In the meantime, let's see, that would be the property that we were going to be doing eventually with Steven Spielberg. But the property that we actually ended up working on came from a very interesting source. Uh, we had lost our funding for our animated feature film, Following the Secret of Nim. And uh, from San Diego came this game developer who was telling, him, telling us about this uh, new technology called a laser disc. And it would allow for random access. And he had developed an idea for a arcade game. And he was calling it Dragon's Lair. And so we got involved in that. We were able to raise the money uh, seed money came from my future father-in-law, Ot Sorrentino, loaned us $20,000 to begin animation on this, which we paid him back eventually. But uh, we were on that production for about six months, and uh, we basically used the same crew that we had available to us on Secret of Nim, And it was terrific. Uh, we got animated special effects, character animation, and some great story because Random access, the laser displayer would allow us to, when we come to a threat, we can either go to the left or to the right or go forward. And so it's basically an interactive story. You're making your own movie, in other words. There's never been anything like it before. The only thing uh, up until that point uh, was uh, uh, Pac-Man. So having an interactive movie experience was a brand new show. It was amazing. And when the, when the game first came out, uh, it shocked the theater owner, or it shocked the arcade owners. Uh, they had never seen anything. There were lines around, outside the door, around the block, people with stacks of quarters ready to play the game. 
And any of the champion players who got to, you know, as far as halfway point, making their way to the treasure room, they became heroes. So they attracted huge crowds themselves. Uh, most arcades would have maybe tw six to 12 different consoles of Dragon's Lair already with queues already out the door coming up to each one of those consoles. It was an amazing event. And so we were starting to supply um, arcade owners with lobby cards, posters, one sheets, press kits, and they began treating it almost like a theater experience. They had uh, velvet cord and ropes on, on brass poles leading each of the queues up to the consoles. It was, it was amazing. So that went on for about a year and a half. We had uh, the first Dragon's Lair game that we did. We did Space Ace. And then we were about ready to release Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp when the marketplace f collapsed. It just absolutely cratered. We had, uh, we had uh, business partners who did not develop uh, at all any kind of after sales service. So one by one, the laser disc players started to malfunction and break down and there were no replacements. So the arcade owners, it went from absolute jubilance and, and, and elation to angry, <laughs> they, were, they, they hated us. <laughs> so we, lost, we basically lost that business. We ended up going to court and suing our partners. We were able to retain the franchise and the ownership of uh, Dragon's Lair and Space Ace. But it, it's a shame that because we could have gone on for another 10 years developing future games and future projects, but it just was not to be. Um, right around the time that uh, we were finishing up um, Land Before Time two, or um, um, Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp, Steven Spielberg contacted and says, I've got the script, I've got a story. Let's get together and we can have our first story meeting. And so we began de uh, developing the story that was fleshed out from a smaller story idea about this family of Russian Jewish mice that immigrate to the United States just as they were completing the Statue of Liberty. And that turned out to be American Tale. And um, I just had coffee with Fievel Mouskowitz last week. <laughs> Um, Philip Glasser is one of our neighbors. I mean, he lives in Franklin, we live in Brentwood, so we had coffee together and it was terrific. We did a uh, event for GalaxyCon. It was a 35 year reunion, virtual reunion, not like this where we get to be live together, but a virtual uh, reunion of the cast and crew from American Tale. It was wonderful, it was terrific. It was great seeing him too because we're gonna be doing other little road events and other conventions together because this is the 35th anniversary and they want to get some airplay out of that. But um, Fievel Mouskowitz was uh, the hero. Now let me do a drawing of Fievel. So once again, and we seem to be on a path here where we're doing a lot of mice pictures. So it's like going rescuers, Bjorn Bianca, Mrs. Frisbee, or Mrs. Brisby, and then Fievel Mouskowitz. So we start out once again with a circle. I get a little eye line there. Now Fievel had this great big floppy hat that his father gave him at the beginning of the story. If you guys have seen the movie, see little eyebrows, little separation down the middle of his forehead. His little mouth and teeth, rounded, cute little cheeks. And they had this little spiky hair coming off of each side of his cheek. His little tunic. And then the great big brim, the f floppy brim of his father's cap that he gives to Fifel at the beginning of the movie. And there's one ear there, other part of his forehead, there his other ear, and there's Fievel Mouskowitz. Oh, I gotta get his little whiskers. And I always like to get his nose reflection too. So the five old mouse quits. Oh, and I forgot his eyelashes. Got cute little eyelashes.
So when this, in this partnership, uh, we aligned ourselves with a very powerful entertainment machinery, Universal, Amblin Universal, Steven Spielberg's company partnered with um, Universal Studios. And they knew how to market an animated feature film. Now this was their, our first film venture with uh, Steven Spielberg. And it made animation history because for the first time, an animated feature film was now grossing numbers that a live action hit, a live action movie would, would do. And when it came out, it, um, it outdid, I think, uh, the latest Disney film, which was uh, Great Mouse Detective. And our film came out, American Tale, and did about 65, 70 million dollars domestically, which was unheard of. And suddenly, every studio in Hollywood, their ears perked up, because now they all knew, hey, this is a money-making venture, animation, we should take this seriously. So one by one, Warners, Fox, Paramount, Universal, they all began their own animation studios. And all of a sudden, there was this explosion, worldwide, actually, of animation product that was being done. And uh, it, it, was, it was amazing to watch. I mean, um, competition breeds excellence. And we kind of made this point to Disney when we left back in 1979. And we knew that th the impact, they would feel it, and they would have their own animation re renaissance, which they did. And, you know, immediately they came running back with their own uh, um, Oliver and Company, Little Mermaid, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So it strengthened the industry as a whole, which was great, because now there's tons of work for animators worldwide. Um, and virtually speaking, I'm never out of work because I'm always being approached by either Warners or Disney or Universal or some studio, which is wonderful. It's a great, healthy industry. Um, so American Tail, its success, uh, we were called into a meeting with Steven Spielberg, and while we were having our lunch, and he's picking the crumbs off his plate, he says, I've got another idea I want to share with you guys. Picture this, <laughs> a little dinosaur, a dinosaur and his family, and they're trying to find the, the, the valley where they want to live. And he had all these little ideas for set pieces. Steven's not real great with a, an entire story, but he, what he gets is these tentpole set pieces that he likes to build a story around. And he wanted to bring in his other partner, George Lucas, to work with us on this, which was a blessing because George Lucas is more, more, has more savvy in creating an overall plot line and story. But this next picture turned out to be the land before time, the first one, not the following 15 or 16 <laughs> sequels that followed. So it, the whole story centers around Littlefoot. And, you know, of course, uh, I had the one sequence where I had to animate Littlefoot saying goodbye to his mother because her mother is saving Littlefoot from the claws and jaws of a Tyrannosaurus. And in the fight, she gets mortally wounded and she dies. And so there's this little moment where they're together and uh, he has to say goodbye to her. And he has to go and find his way to the valley where the rest of his family is going to be. And on the way, his little odyssey starts. On his way, he picks up a little duckbill dinosaur, Ducky, a little stegosaurus named Spike, a little pterodactyl named Petrie, and a little triceratops named Sarah. And the five of them together travel together. And it's all about their collective you know, friendship and their survival. And it's interesting because it was kind of, in a way, it was mirroring something in our own life that we were going to experience ourselves because eventually we were going to take that production over to Dublin, Ireland and start a studio there. So um, let me draw a picture of Littlefoot. Is that okay if I draw, keep drawing? Is that okay? Um, So Littlefoot, um, the basic head starts out as kind of a, almost like a, I don't know, elongated uh, wafer shape, and then his long neck, because he's a long neck. And 
let's see, he has kind of an eye line that wraps around his, his skull here, and he has his eyes. Tiny little eyelashes, there's his eyebrow. His little nose, a little dinosaur nose that comes out with a nostril at the end, and then the muzzle of his mouth, and then his, his cheek line right under his eye, and then the beginning of his mouth, and then the forward part of his muzzle is kind of squared off. And then the bottom jaw, his mouth, his jawline, the bottom part of his mouth, little ear in the back, the back of his head. And we colored this kind of, this is a, a color that was darker. And then he had like a little ridge of scales on the back of his neck kind of wrinkles under his, his uh, jawline there, and then his neck. So Littlefoot, we were in uh, production for about, oh, about a year and a half. And uh, because of economics, um, our um, chief executive officer, Morris Sullivan, was approaching uh, overseas uh, interest. He was uh, sending out letters to other countries, finding out if there was any interest in developing an animation industry there. And South America, Mexico, Canada, China, Japan, Europe, uh, he was sending out, you know, invitations to all of them. And the one that came back that was uh, just very eager and very excited was Ireland. The Industrial Developmental Authority, IDA, came back and said, we would love to partner with you in this venture. Please come to Dublin, Ireland, because our art community is leaving in droves. There's no art product for them to work on. There's no industry there. So we left there. Um, we left there, it was Thanksgiving, 1986, and a crew of about uh, 40 American artists and 15 or 20 Canadian artists flew to Dublin and began building the studio. And uh, it was an amazing ven venture. It, uh, it, uh, at first, it was like the Land Before Time movie. Different cultures, different types of people trying to coexist together. You don't understand, sometimes you don't understand the language, the way they talk in their brogue. You didn't understand the culture, but eventually we became very, very united like one big family. And so we finished uh, Land Before Time there in Dublin, Ireland. That's why it's a Sullivan Bluth production along with George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. The next production that we worked on after that was All Dogs Go to Heaven. And that's a story that centers around the main character, a, German, a, a mongrel German shepherd named Charlie B. Barkin. And um, he uh, is in league with his little uh, dachshund friend, Itchy Itchiford Dachshund. And together, they want to, uh, they, they want to go to the w racetrack and make it, make it big with betting. They're gamblers. And, but they find out that this girl named Anne Marie can talk to animals. So they con her into joining them and going to the racetrack to make the big bets, to make them successful so Charlie can open up his big casino that he has. Um, that was followed by, okay, so um, Pocahontas will be my next picture. We did, uh, my, my partners and I, uh, Don and Gary, we did um, Troll in Central Park, Thumbelina, and Rockadoodle after we did All Dogs Go to Heaven. I started feeling us getting stale in our storytelling. To me, I felt that we were kind of um, committing the same type of creative errors that we were accusing Disney of. We were kind of in a creative rut. And um, the partnership was going through some financial troubles at that time. So one thing led to another and I sold out my shares in the studio and I returned back to Disney. Um, I was uh, wearing the producer's hat so firmly and so often I didn't get to draw anymore and I was facing burnout big time. And what resuscitated me was returning back to a former love, painting. I loved painting. 
And so while I was taking a painting workshop, uh, a dear friend of mine, Don Hahn, approached me. Don Hahn, big producer over Disney feature animation. He uh, produced um, uh, uh, Hunchback, uh, Lion King, Beauty and the Beast. He said, John, how would you like to come back to Disney Studios? <laughs> and so he took me out to lunch and he told me about this project that was, that was amazing and he wanted me to meet their executive, Jeffrey Katzenberg. So one thing led to another, and I became the supervising animator of Captain John Smith on Pocahontas. And I got to be reunited with an old friend of mine from my first Disney days, a guy named Glenn Keane, who had become quite a star animator. Um, and together, we, they, we worked together. He did Pocahontas, I did Captain John Smith. And it was a wonderful picture to work on. We were on that for about two and a half years. Um, and Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the executive producer, he wanted to do this film the best possible way. And being human characters, it's human characters are the hardest thing to animate, simply because with cartoon characters, you can cheat the action a little bit and you'd never notice. But with animating a human being, if you're off by a fraction, it ruins the whole illusion. And in animation, we're always trying to engage the audience. Do you believe that this character is real? We want to engage you in the willing suspension of disbelief. That's our main objective. And if we're successful, then one day we get to sit in, an, in a theater in the darkness, and I get to hear the audible laughter or crying or gnashing of teeth to the villain that I've created. That's my reward. But he wanted to do, you know, a spectacle. And so what he had was the two directors that we had with us, um, Mike Gabriel and Eric Goldberg, we shot the whole picture in live action and then used live action footage as a reference for the animating of Pocahontas and Captain John Smith and even a Governor Ratcliffe. So it became um, a help for us to use to make that action look authentic. Now the trick is to take live action and then convert that over to animation, you have to push it, you have to caricature it or else it looks very stiff and mechanical, it doesn't work. So we had our job cut out for us and we had these enormous crews of 15 uh, our, um, other animators that we had to supervise our work. So Glenn had 15 people that were working on Pocahontas night and day and I had 15 that were working on John Smith. It was a great project, I really enjoyed it. Um, after that, was Fantasia 2000. And I got to uh, work real closely with um, um, Walt Disney's nephew, Roy E. Disney. Uh, we became friends. If you, come to, uh, if you come over to my table, which is at C2, you'll see the book that says uh, Walt's Imagination. The very back is a picture of Roy Disney and myself. He was great. I could go in his office like two and three times a week and pitch him ideas about stories that I had. He was always listening and he was great to work with. Uh, but that, that followed up. We, um, I was working on the uh, ending sequence of uh, the Firebird Suite in Fantasia 2000. And then that was followed by my favorite project. And the answer to your question about who's your favorite character, here it is, Milo Thatch. And let me, indulge me while I draw a Milo, okay? <laughs> now Milo's design is interesting because um, I did a design, I did probably 30 or 40 different design ideas for Milo and what he looked like. He had to be kind of bookish, uh, kind of nerdy, he was a cartographer, linguistics, uh, I mean, a librarian type. So he had big spectacles, uh, kind of slightly unkept, uh, bow tie, vest. Uh, this is dated like around 18, uh, 1915, just before the America, uh, before the United States kind of war, evolved with World War I. And so it had to have all, uh, kind of the, almost a Victorian feel to him. And my character looked more like Nicolas Cage than it did the actual Milo Thatch. But uh, the directors did an interesting thing. They were real uh, comic book geeks and they, they really loved the work of, a, of the creator of Hellboy, Mike Mignola. And they brought Mike Mignola in to give us a design pass. And at first I didn't like it and then once I got working with it, everything that Mike Mignola did was very hard edged and structured. 
totally different than the soft, cuddly, cutesy Disney approach that we would normally work in with uh, Disney character designs. This had some edge to it, and we loved it. Uh, we worked on that film for two and a half years, and I still draw Milo in that way, uh, you know, where the fingernails are just chopped off, these little triangular fingernails. It gave us a language that permeated the entire production as far as the graphic look of the picture. And uh, our, our crew shirts read, you know, no songs, more explosions. You know, that's, that's the, the directors were trying to push it, trying to push it away from the normal Disney uh, animated family musical. So here's how we draw um, Milo. We start with a spinning top, you know, a, a top, that shape right there. Uh, we got an eye line, we got a nose. Two eyes, jawline. Now, one of the things that influences the design of a character is who they get to record the voice. You know, in this case, it was Michael J. Fox, and he was brilliant. He had a way of his very crooked mouth sometimes when he'd get very excited. And I was there sketching him during the sound recording. Uh, when we were recording his voice. And it was amazing. Um, this character, the success of a character is based on how well you can blend the recorded vocal, vocal performance to the actual animated character design when they come together. And this, this came out perfectly. Michael J. Fox's voice matched perfectly with the design of Milo Thatch. They became one. Of course, I was mixed in there somewhere too because I was the creator of the, of the character and I had to animate it. And so he became kind of an amalgamation of Michael J. Fox, Milo Thatch, and John Pomeroy. I shot my own live action of myself just to make sure that I could perfect the performance and make it believable for the audience. Uh, it wasn't in the budget to shoot live action, so I just shot my own. And early, you know, I'd be downstairs in our basement bathroom at two and three o'clock in the morning shooting, making a lot of noise to, you know, dialogue playback. And my wife came down <laughs> thinking, oh, we're being robbed. There's a prowler in our downstairs bathroom. And it turned out to be me. So, uh, <laughs> but all of this was used to perf perfect the performance. And uh, the reason why it's probably one of my favorite characters is, you know, the crew was fantastic, but it's the closest thing I've ever come to animating a self-portrait of myself. So. Getting back to the design, let's start, uh, we got his cheek line here, his mouth, slightly crooked mouth, and this is all inspired by Michael J. Fox, who did a great job as the voice of Milo Thatch. Eyebrows, side of the hair, we've got a very hard edge ear, the top of the head, got the hair that's hanging over in his eyes and then a wave coming up the side of his head. And this is the way, this is the way I would capture his his drawing if I were animating it. It's just very loose. If you, if you were to flip the drawings, all of these sketchy little lines give an impression of an entity alive. And that's, that's, the, that's the fun part about animating, when you bring something alive and you see something living and breathing into all these little chicken scratch lines. And then we, last, uh, we have these great big spectacles. neck, and then his crew, sweater. He became part of this uh, team of explorers looking for the lost city of Atlantis. So there's Milo Thatch. Let's see how much time have I got. Oh, I'm right at zero. I'm right at zero. I think that's it, right? <laughs> see, I can go on for another two hours if you want, but it's like I only have five. 
uh, 45 minutes. Hey, uh, one last moment, uh, one last thing I want to mention is uh, please follow me on Instagram on John Pomeroy Art because I'm, we're going to be announcing uh, in about two months we're going to be releasing my first series of tutorials called Pomeroy Art Academy. So please follow me on Instagram with further announcements on this. It's going to be a great launch, a great series of uh, uh, animation tutorials on how to storyboard, animate, how to build your character, how to design your character, how to do backgrounds, how to animate special effects. So it'll be a great tutorial series. It's been wonderful. Thank you all, everybody in YouTube. Thank you for my audience. Pleasure. Thank you. Let's give another round for John Pomeroy. Hey, all right. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.